What is up, party people? It is Rags and Riches here with another market update to round out the week. I've taken a few days off because I have been a simple degenerate for the past four days. It has been absolutely lovely, plenty of adult beverages, but I have been focused on the markets dialed into my crypto, and today I want to talk to you guys about the publicly traded equity markets alongside my dividend portfolio, and then more importantly, the talk about a deep dive into the U.S. economy the recent GDP report that just came out and some of the implications that that is going to have to you as an investor moving forward heading into next week, next month, and then as we close out the year 2024. A lot to get into today. I don't want to keep you on the standby because who likes a long video with a madman rambling except for myself because that is what I am. So getting into news, let me pull up my Brave browser. By the way, if you have not heard of this before, great way to make some crypto rewards you can earn the bat basic attention token for using it this is not a sponsorship it is literally a free way to make passive income plus it's using the chromium browser as a base so you have all the cool things that you like about chrome extensions ad blocker and crypto rewards i'm not sure what more that i could ask for but here getting into the news u.s gdp grew at 4.9 percent annual pace in the third quarter better than expected this is coming out from cnbc by jeff cox now a few key points that i want to point out from the article here GDP, gross domestic product, a measure of all goods and services produced in the U.S., rose at 4.9% annual pace in the third quarter. This is ahead of a 4.7% estimate. This was a beat of estimates. Now, the sharp increase came due to contributions from consumer spending, increased inventories, exports, residential investment, and this is most important, government spending. We'll get into that in a bit more detail in just a moment. Now, while the report could give some hope that the Fed has impetus to keep policy tight, this is referring to monetary policy, some of the rate hiking cycle that you may have heard in the past few weeks and months, traders were still pricing in no chance of an interest rate hike when the central bank decides to meet this upcoming week. Now, the U.S. economy grew even faster than expected in the third quarter, buoyed by a strong consumer in spite of higher interest rates, ongoing inflation pressures, and a variety of other domestic and global headwinds. GDP, a measure of all goods and services, rose at a seasonally adjusted 4.9% annual pace in the July through September period, up from an unrevised 2.1% pace in the second quarter. Now to take a moment here to pause guys, when we're thinking about GDP, we think about that as the rate of growth for the US economy. The Fed as a general rule is trying to target an inflation rate, a growth rate, a debasement rate, this is the most important piece, of about 2-3% to annually. When the rate of growth is going beyond that pace of inflation that the Fed is trying to target, this produces likely increased prices over time. This is counterintuitive to what the Fed is trying to accomplish with the rate hiking cycle. They are trying to raise rates to increase the cost of capital, to defer, to stop, to slow down people, consumers, and businesses from spending, which is an interesting note as we head into the Fed FOMC meeting next week. Now to get into some of the details that are pointed out by CNBC, and we're actually going to go directly to a government website to drill into it ourselves, this sharp increase came due to contributions from consumer spending, increased inventories, exports, residential investment in government spending. Now consumer spending as measured by personal consumption expenditures increased 4% after rising 0.8% in Q2 and was responsible for 2.7 percentage points of total GDP increase. Inventories contributed to 1.3 percentage points. Gross private domestic investments surged 8.4% and government spending and investments jumped by 4.6%. Now, consuming on the spending on the consumer level was split pretty evenly between goods and services, according to CNBC. Two measures were up 4.8 and 3.6% respectively. And now this increase increased this uh, GDP increase represented the biggest gain since the fourth quarter of 2021. Now, CNBC at the time of writing this article said markets reacted little to, me, to the news. I vehemently disagree with this, and we're going to get into the charts in a moment to really drill deeper into this. But getting into some more economic news here from CNBC, this is now tying into some of the wider context of what we're seeing into the labor market. So in other economic news on Thursday, the labor market reported that jobless claims totaled 210,000 for the week, ending in October 2021 or October 21st of 2023, up 10,000 from the previous period and slightly ahead of the Dow Jones estimate for 207,000. Durable goods orders, now you can think of these of things like 
cans, aluminums, chairs, tables, cars, things that are hard, right? You know, not software, services, etc. These increased by 4.7% in September, well ahead of the 0.1% gain in August in the 2% forecast, according to the Commerce Department. Now, CNBC is going to ramble on a bit about this, but I want to make a point here going into the next page from the BEA. <sighs> Drilling into the article here. Diving deeper, deeper, deeper. Where are you? There we are. So... Driving into the personal income section here, current dollar personal income increased by $199.5 billion in the third quarter compared to an increase of $239.6 billion in the second quarter. Now this increase reflected increases in compensation, proprietor's income, personal income receipts on assets, and rental income of persons that were partly offset by a decrease in the current transfer receipts. This is table eight. Now, disposable personal income increased by $95.8 billion or 1.9% in the third quarter compared to an increase of $296.5 billion or 6.1% in the second quarter. And then personal savings was $776.9 billion in the third quarter compared to the $1.04 trillion in the second quarter. Now that we have the facts laid out on the table, I think this is crucial and needed context for actually us to get into the conversation about GDP. What does this mean heading into FOMC meeting next week? And pardon me, I'm going to take a sip of my energy drink because those are back on the table. Dollar Tree had them back. One sec. So, what has the Fed been doing since all of this year and all of last year? Raising rates. Why has the Fed needed to raise rates? because inflation was too high. Inflation was too high for a variety of factors to rattle off three real quick. We had supply chain shocks from the COVID-19 pandemic. We had massive government stimulus injected into the pockets of the American consumer via stimulus checks. And we had major instances of quantitative easing for the period of 2020 through 2021 by the Federal Reserve. So when the Fed raises rates, they are trying to slow down current and future demand in the economy. How does this functionally work? Because America and arguably the Western world and more arguably the entire planet is based on a debt-based system, people use debt to fund their consumption in the current time. Now, what is debt in a realistic sense? You're driving forward your future income to spend today for ideally the hope of having an outsized return to then coup a profit, meaning if you're gonna take $100 from my future self, then I got to pay a 10% rate on it. I know I'm going to owe $110 the next year, but if I think I can make $120, $130 off of the $100 that I made, my net profit will be $15 to $20, meaning I am beating my future income by spending it today for an investment that I find in today's present moment. The issue when you raise rates, or not necessarily an issue, but a feature of this, is because people and consumers and businesses, generally speaking, have a fixed rate of demand and a, generally speaking, a fixed income, a fixed supply of money that is projected to come in, when you raise rates, you will slow down future demand. Because if I think I can make an investment today at a 10% hurdle rate, that same investment may not make sense if that hurdle rate is no longer 10%, but is 12%, 13%, 15%. And I use a large number to make a point because we had 0% rates for the period of 2010 to 2020, but now we have a 5.25% Fed funds rate likely to go to 5.5 next week. Now, this ties into the American consumer as well. With interest rates higher than they have been before, with the equity markets volatile as they have been, with interest rates now being much higher than they have been in the past, people in effect, because Americans' balance sheets are highly comprised of debt, are needing to spend more and more of their personal income in today's environment to fund previous expenses that were incurred using debt. When rates rise, credit card payments rise. When rates rise, mortgage rates rise. When rates rise, auto loans rise. And this is hurting the American consumer. Let's look at this right here. Personal savings was at $776.9 billion in the third quarter compared to 1.04 trillion in the second quarter. This means in a period of three months, the American consumer spent a quarter of their savings. A quarter of their savings. This is if you had $100,000 in your savings account, you just spent 25,000. Why are people spending this much money? 
and I hate to get a little bit passionate about this, but it's the reality of the matter, is because Americans are broke. The economy is broken. People need to spend their savings today to fund expenses which they thought weren't going to be as high as they are today. Why is this taking place? Because the Fed raised rates, and at some point the American consumer is not going to have sufficient income to spend in the same way that they have been. What happens when Americans stop spending? Businesses stop making as much profit. When businesses stop making as much profit, they start to lay off people to maintain their profit margins. When people get laid off, what do they do? Stop spending more. This is the downward cycle that leads to recession. So when people say there is going to be a soft landing, there is not going to be a recession, the economy is perfectly fine, I say you're full of crap because if I just spend a quarter of my savings in three months, clearly something in the math is not correct because the Fed's effect on their rate hikes is working just slowly. We're starting to see this in the equity markets. Let's get into the next chart. We'll get back here in a minute because Washington Post is full crap. What did we see in this past week? On the one day chart, we have seen the S&P 500 go down from about 40, or uh, the S&P 500 ETF trade from $425 down to 410. Does this look like a healthy equity market or does this look like a market that sold off due to a Fed hiking cycle? People anticipated rates were going to start getting cut in the middle of this year, aka three months ago, before all people started spending all their cash. They were pricing in future expectations for returns and growth. That clearly did not occur. Inflation still was high. People were still making money. GDP, especially like a 4.6% revised upwards GDP estimate, this is starting to now be priced into the equity markets. What does this mean? This means that investors looking for 6, 9, 12, 16, 18 months see that likely more rate hikes are in the cards. The notion for a higher interest rate environment for longer is more likely to occur. This is a breakdown of the chart. This was why I remember trading it when I remember day trading like fucking penny stocks when this chart here was around. I remember getting up to 400, not thinking we could break out. We broke out. And I remember this price level here when we had immense amounts of volatility. I could swear this was the top of the market, or at least when things were starting to get really frothy. And they did. Because ever since then, we had a breakout into 470, and then we've been retesting. Couldn't hold the sport. This is an extremely important price level here, where we are right now. If we cannot sustain these levels, where are the next targets at? 400. 385, 369. Now, do I think we're going to get there by the end of the year? Time's going to tell. We need to see what the end of the quarter revisions upwards and revisions downwards for respective company earnings are. But if people think that this is a healthy equity market, I think they're full of it because this is not a healthy equity market. This is a market that is in the process of rolling over in anticipation of a recession. This is starting to get priced in now. And if I were an investor sitting on cash, I wouldn't be buying at these levels. I would be identifying the particular companies that I think are going to be the beneficiaries of a recession. How can you benefit from a recession? When a recession occurs, people are forced to sell assets. When a recession occurs, companies are forced to cut prices to shrink their profit margins. Their multiples go down. Their prices go down. I think we're going to have some really interesting entry points here. We have many gaps we still need to fill as far as this chart is concerned. Gap, gap. You could argue that these were filled on the way up, but no, in my opinion, going out to a more broad market view here. The S&P 500 in my eyes is extremely broad. And I do not like this price level as far as buying. I'd be more interested in nibbling at 350. I'd be very interested in nibbling at 300. I think we're rolling over. That's just me. Come back in three months. Let me know. Now, getting into a post from the Walls or the Washington Post, and I'm going to turn off this handy dandy feature of the Brave browser. This is like efficient speed reading, but you know, everyone likes a good image here. Coming out from Catherine Rample. When will Americans stop worrying and learn to love the U.S. economy? Catherine, you are also full of crap. <laughs> Let's see what you have to say. On paper, at least the U.S. economy looks remarkably good. The report stunning, the recent stunning jobs report has been followed by a stunning GDP report. U.S. economic outgrowth 
Output grew at an annualized pace of 4.9% in the third quarter this year, Commerce Department reported on Thursday after adjusting for inflation and usually seasonal patterns. For context, that's more than double the pace of the prior quarter, fastest growth rate since late 2021, and light years higher than what economists had been expecting not too long ago. Scrolling down. Labor market's still healthy, yes we know. Consumer spending, defying gravity, but I have my stance on that. Just to reiterate for anyone who just hopped or skipped into this section of the video, consumer spending is strong today because people are using debt and they are using their savings. American savings went down a quarter percent in the last quarter. Is that a healthy consumer? I argue not because what is the consumer should be doing over time? saving and investing for their long-term prosperity. What are they doing today? They are spending and consuming for today. So without getting into every single word of the article, because you guys can all read and I have faith that you can do so, the American consumer is not healthy today. They are in a position of weakness with rates, or with rates rising and a credit card balance that is slowly spiraling out of control. This is going to get to a point where they'll need to cut back spending on goods and services. This will trickle into the equity markets. And then over time, this is going to be priced into PE multiples for stocks. What does that mean in simple terms? Consumer spending goes down, stocks go down. When stocks go down, companies lay off people. When companies lay off people, people have no more money. When people have no money, they stop spending. This is the downwards negative cycle that leads to a recession, which we're heading into. Now, some people like Tim Mullaney actually can understand this. As the market enters into correction territory, this is coming out from CNBC, do not blame the American consumer. Well, why would I blame the American consumer for something the Fed actually engaged in and caused, right? The S&P 500 is on the verge of a correction. The NASDAQ has already entered one. Many consumer data points are showing a mostly bullish picture. Yes, we're not looking out forward into the future in that regard, are we? Home sales are being helped by mortgage buy-downs. This is actually a very important point for the real estate market, perhaps a video in its own right. And then where am I seeing softness in consumer credit? Uh, JP Morgan Chief Financial Officer Jeremy Burnham repeating an analyst question on a bank earning call. Well, the reality of the matter is, I think that is actually nowhere. So, hearing about GDP, the economy is rising on the state of the consumer. People are, this is it. This is where we really start to get into the reality of what's happening here. People are kind of scratching their heads and saying, the consumer is holding up better than expected. Consumers are employed, they continue to buy goods as well as pursue experiences, and they don't seem worried about debt levels. But how is this possible with interest rates on everything from credit cards to cars and homes soaring? And anecdotes from bellwether companies across industries tell the real story, right? Delta Airlines. And United Airlines are sharing how most of their expensive seats are selling fastest. Homeowners are using high interest rate fighting mortgage buy-downs. Amazon saying it's hiring 250,000 seasonal workers. A Thursday report from Decker's Outdoor blew some minds in what has been a tepid closing sales environment by declosing that it's embedded a 79% profit gain and sent shares up 19% was a sale. Uh, it's a mature line anchored by Fuzzy Boots, you know, the ones that all the girls in high school and college were. So, really, I think what we're seeing here is that the consumer is blowing out their savings. They're using debt to fund their lifestyle because they look forward into the future and they're not thinking very too critically about it. What do I mean by this? If you think you're going to have a prosperous tomorrow, if you think pay raises are on the rise, if you think you're going to have more money than you did before, if you think that tomorrow is going to be better than today, then there may be a case where you can use credit to fuel some of your lifestyle spending today because over time, your income is going to level out the increased spending that you have. But what if the consumer is wrong? What if in the same way that heading into the dot-com bubble, they thought the internet was going to change the world, which it did, they were just too early in that call, and the stock market crashes? What happens if people think the housing market, like in 2008, is going to continue to rise in perpetuity, that housing market never goes down, that people always pay their mortgage, they get a second, third, fourth investment property using adjustable rate mortgages, plot twist, the Fed hikes rates, the economy goes into slowdown, and then housing market crashes that trickles into the rest of the economy. 
what happens if one event like a random pandemic coming out of some place in China that no one's ever heard of before causes the government to shut down the economy for people to lose their jobs and for spending to stop completely for everyone to get shut inside their house and the stock market crashes? Consumers are not logical or rational. Consumers, and this is just Econ 101, are going to make decisions which don't make logical sense if there's a long-term strategic planning method going on in there. Consumers are spending money they are supposed to have tomorrow today with no guarantee that they're going to have it tomorrow. But when we see these underlying cracks in the economy, when we see GDP being artificially uplifted by consumer spending as well as government spending, all fueled on by debt with a higher interest rate than we can actually afford, is this really a healthy economy? Or is this economy that's on the brink and just needs one thing to crack, like a regional banking crisis that isn't backstopped by the Federal Reserve, to actually start having some negative amount impacts into the markets? Again, this is just my opinion, but I think the, the market's pricing that in, so am I necessarily wrong? All right. And talking about the market pricing this in, we're starting to see this in the Dow Jones. Dow drops more than 350 points to end a brutal week. S&P 500 closes in correction territory. Renewed selling on fears of recession dragged the Dow Jones Industrial Average lower on Friday and push, pushed the S&P 500 into correction territory. 30 stock Dow fell 366.71 points or 1.12% at the close. The S&P 500 slipped 0.48% to finish the season at 411 for 4,111.17.37, closing a 10.3% lower from this year's peak in July. The Dow is also pressured by declines by JP Morgan Chase's CEO, Jamin Dimon, saying that he plans to sell 1 million shares next year. Now, the NASDAQ is still holding up higher, but if we break down into individual stocks in the NASDAQ, that may not actually be the case. We have mega tech stocks drive by future earnings that are increasingly taking on a monopolistic share in the U.S. economy, growing their profit margins by pushing out some of the weaker companies in tech. This is make this makes a lot of sense. When you have tech crises and tech companies falling apart, big players in space are going to take up their space in the market, potentially increasing future profits. And when you have an index that is heavily weighted to one, two, three stocks, Amazon, Facebook, Meta, Tesla, etc., it makes sense why the overall indexes are going to be buoyed upwards. But if you look at an individual company level, if you look at the more no-name companies like Ford, like UAW, like Walgreens, like Dollar General, are those companies really doing healthy? Are their employees happy? Or are they striking? Are they posting better profit margins than they did the year before? Or are they having to revise their estimates downwards because of future and weakening demand? Right? So when I think about the equity markets next year, I think we're not heading into a period of rapid growth like our GDP estimates from the third quarter are going to represent. I think we're heading into a period of extreme weakness where underlying these large indexes that are buoyed up by the same five stocks that everyone invests in via their 401k plans, the American consumer is not in a good place. They're spending more money than they have. Their debt balances are going up. Interest rates are rising. The housing market hasn't fallen apart because there's no inventory and everyone is locked in a 3% mortgage. And sure, your 401k balance is looking in a healthy spot, but because Amazon, Google, and Facebook are rallying like they always do. But if you're invested in anything besides the index fund, is your portfolio really doing that good? Probably not. Now getting into a bit of talk about the bond market. Wall Street week ahead of frazzled U.S. stock markets eyed frothy treasury market as the Fed looms. This is coming in from Reuters' David Randall. Financial markets are bracing for what could be a momentous week with a Federal Reserve FOMC meeting, U.S. employment data and earnings from tech-heavy Apple Inc. possibly setting up the course for stocks and bonds for the remainder of the year. Now, October seasonally and historically is a pretty volatile month for the u.s equity markets a surge of u.s treasury yields and geopolitical uncertainty has certainly pressured stocks on a monthly basis the s p 500 is down 3.5 percent adding to losses that have left it over 10 percent off its late july high now whether the ride remains tough for the remainder of 2023 is going to depend on a large part in the bond market the Fed's quote-unquote higher for longer stance on interest rates and rising U.S. fiscal worries pushed a 10-year Treasury yield, which moves inversely to prices to 5% earlier this month. Now, this is the highest level that we have seen the 10-year Treasury since 2007. We're finally back into an economy which is near and approaching real, real interest rates. 
real positive interest rates. And when I say real interest rates, I mean the rate of interest that you're going to get from a security, whether it is a treasury, a dividend, etc., minus out the rate of inflation. If that number is positive, you have real interest. If it's negative, then you have real negative interest. Now, investors are beginning to worry that yields could rise further as the Fed reinforces its hawkish message that the central bank's November 1st monetary policy meeting um, and strong U.S. employment data from next Friday could also be a catalyst for bond yields to rise further if it bolsters the case for keeping rates elevated to cool the economy to prevent inflation from rebounding. Well, uh, bad news for everyone who is hoping for a true pause heading into the end of the year. GDP is hotter than bacon on the skillet. The job market is popping off like we went to Ibiza and we had 20 shots of champagne. I think a rate hike is very likely heading into Wednesday this upcoming week. And then should that happen, I think this is something that the bond market is not priced in fully yet. And we can actually get into a chart to see this here. So I think we touched enough on the equity markets correcting, you know, stock for tumbling. Now let's take a look at the bond market, right? Going back to our conversation around the S&P 500, right? This is a chart of the 20-year Treasury bond ETF. This is the ETF called TLT, comprised of Treasury bills that have a 20-year maturity. This is the IEF ETF, and this is a Treasury ETF that has yield to maturities of about 7 to 10 years. Now, a lot of the chart makes sense since the hiking cycle began, right? Pandemic happens. Bond prices spike is the Fed quantitative eases. We head to the latter part of this year. Investors realize at some point the Fed is going to have to pivot to push off the gas, start pumping the brakes as far as inflation goes. You have a sell-off. Heading into the end of 2021, this is when the hiking cycle really begins, and then quantitative tapering also begins. Bond market rolls over. Summer of 2022, slight retracement. Hope towards the end of the year, thinking a cut is on the table. Heading into the winter, cuts not looking likely. Maybe Q1, Q2, the 2023. That didn't happen. We are rolling over. Does this look like a healthy bond market? Does this look like a healthy bond market? No, it does not, because the bond market is not healthy. We're rolling over right now, and even if we scroll on onto a weekly basis, is this a bullish week? Or is this just a retracement upwards before we have another leg down? In my eyes, there's more downwards moves for the bond market. If you think about it from the macro perspective, the economy, at least on paper, is far too hot. Inflation is far too high. The consumer is far too strong for the Fed to stop cutting rates. Jerome Powell has a very tough choice to make here as a professional. And this is removing the politics and economics and finance aside from all this conversation. He can be a Paul Volcker type figure who does the tough job of killing inflation by raising rates to places that we have no idea and no expectation of where they need to go to get there, to continue to hike until he breaks the back of the American consumer and economy to stop growth and to stop inflation by consequence. Or he can pump the gas, or sorry, he can pump the brakes, stop hiking, and allow inflation to rebound. And once inflation is entrenched, which arguably it is, it is very hard to get the GD back into the bottle once it's let out. My eyes, we got more room down where it's here in the bond market, and I think that is coming to bite everyone in the butt pretty shortly. One more article here to close out the day, people. So the Biden administration has forgiven $127 billion in student debt. Now, what are you going to do about these relief options? This is coming in from CNBC from Annie Nova. One second here, I'm going to have another sip of my energy drink. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> President Joe Biden has managed to cancel 127 of student loan debt so far, more so than any president in U.S. history. Consumer advocates praised the president for his actions, but are pressuring him to do more. As far as different relief options go, you have income-driven repayment plans. These date back to 1994, which allow student loan borrowers to pay a share of their earnings towards their debt each month and to get any debt forgiven remaining after a set period of time. Four different plans, which if you look up this article, you can find it there. Next one is going to be student or public service student forgiveness. 
Now, this program signed into law by George W. Bush back in 2007 allows for certain not-for-profit and government employees to have their federal student loans discharged after 10 years of on-time payments. In 2013, the CFPB estimated that one quarter of American workers may be eligible for this program, so that is option number two. Number three, got total and permanent disability discharge. So the Biden administration has also forgiven the student debt of more than 500,000 disabled borrowers. If you happen to get run over by a car, you can actually qualify for disability. Perhaps you can get rid of your student loan payments. So uh, not saying you should do that, but that is an option if you're really deep in the hole. Option number four, the final option, borrower defense. So another 1.3 million borrowers have walked away from their debt over the past few years thanks to the borrower defense loan discharge program. These people receive $22.5 billion in relief, and you can be eligible for discharge if your school suddenly closed or if you were cheated out of your education by your college for fraudulent practices. So really all, all Biden has done is gotten rid of student loan payments for the disabled and those who are defrauded. Um, Candidly, I think one of the reasons why student loan payments have gotten so high is because the government has intervened into the space into the first place. Markets work efficiently when you actually allow them to work. When people can get a student loan backstopped by the government for any price, for any kind of degree, without any future prospects for getting a job, <coughs> gender studies, um, it's a good reason why student loan payments have gotten up so high, because colleges will charge as much as they're able to get people to take on debt for for whatever education that they think they're going to get. Now, this speaks more broadly into the American educational system, speaking more specifically to the public educational system with a one-size-fits-all, everyone's a special snowflake, everyone is going to make it and be happy in America kind of mentality, which then promulgates and allows people to go to college for a four-year party session where they don't actually learn anything or do anything or gain any skills to contribute to the economy and to the world, and then they do so on debt, which they don't pay for until they get out, and then they get a little bit confused why the payments are so high and they make so little. But we're going to have to see how this materializes over the next coming five to ten years. There is certainly a wave of problems that are brewing as far as student loan payments go. They just began up in October of this year, so just about 29 days ago. And to share a personal anecdote, I got a buddy from back in high school, caught up with him for the first time in a little while ago, met this nice old girl. She uh, went to college and she got some student loans. Now, she has had her loans on deferment for the past three years since COVID-19 began, she's never made once a payment about it. Despite all the letters and news articles and media and all the ways that her servicers try to contact her on her student loans, she has refused to make payments. As a consequence, her credit score has gone down considerably and they're starting to send her to collections. And this is a problem that they're gonna have to sort out, but this is a situation that many borrowers are gonna get into. Even if people have the capacity to want to make payments, there is this victim mentality that I think has made its way through the American psychology for especially millennials, Gen Z, and then, I don't know what the one after that is going to be called. I think it's like Gen Alpha, like all those kids are in school right now. But basically, the point I'm trying to make is that people don't think they're responsible for their actions, and this is going to have consequences moving on down the line from a political and economic stance. Now, to close out today, at some point into the future, I do plan on showing you guys my dividend portfolio here on Weeble, at least so you can see the individual assets that are here. Got companies like BNP Paribas, Aries Capital, SCM, Stellas Capital Investment Corporation, Stag Industrial Inc., Cisco, P. Pfizer, KMB, Walmart, etc. Um, but that's not going to take place today because we've already been here for called 35 minutes. So on that note, I want you to take the remainder of your weekend and enjoy some time with your family. I think we're heading into some tumultuous times for the U.S. economy, but when there's blood in the street, even if the blood is your own, there is opportunity for success. So please be sure to continue to stack your sats because I do love my cryptocurrency. Buy into the equity markets because we do have a dip coming in here. Fuck the bond market because the bond market is not a good place to be right now. And don't forget to turn your rags into riches. I will see you all next time. Have a great rest of your day.